look, um, there's there's no, we can't be hiding. Koba umise Ramaphosa is a businessman. Yeah. For him, his bottom line is profit. <laughs> you can't take him and make him a president of a country whereby his bottom line must be service um, delivery. Service delivery. Yeah. And of order speaker is that you are disrupting speakers when they are addressing you and, and speaker honorable zungola please, you are violating please take your seat. rule 66 please take addressing. your seat honorable zungola you are, you are violating the honorable rule honorable zungola will you please you are interrupting take me. your seat i'm not done speaker honorable zungola i'm not done take speaker, your seat i'm a member of parliament i've honorable got the right zungula, to raise a point of order i am calling you for the third time speaker, honorable zungola i am raising the point of order honorable zungula i'm raising the point of order I have called you out thrice now. ...is a topic that has been, I think, for many decades, um, even preceding the apartheid regime, that obviously inflicted a lot of hurts in people's lives. But African transformation even comes from a fact that, as Africans, many, many of us, um, especially as black native Eric Africans, many of us have been marginalized, many of us have had things taken from us, many of us have had our mineral resources taken, and we're at a time where we are, I'd say, woke. We are aware that we need to get things back and we need to get the African person, the African child, out of poverty and make them to be able to participate in the economy and not just participate only, also be leaders in different spheres of the economy. So today, I I'm with the leader of the African Transformation Movement. Um, he's also he's the president, the leader. Um, he'll correct me and tell me which one it is. His name is Vuyo Zungolo. He's also a member of parliament, which means he is going to be held accountable maybe by yeah. us today mm -hmm. for the decisions and the things that he says in parliament as a person who we have sent to parliament to do things for us and um, express our, our feelings towards certain issues. Puti and thank you for inviting us. Sure. Um, uh, just... What is the African transformation movement for the person who's hearing about it for the first time? Because it obviously doesn't fall in the so-called big four parties in the country. Yeah, no, ATM to, um, to a lot of people is a political party that was formed in 2018, mm -hmm. largely by people who were um, like, um, you know, in the traditional spaces, which is Amakosi, yeah. um, Amazon, and community leaders with the sole objective of just providing solutions to the problems we face in the country. Yeah. Our premise we founded on transformation because okay. we believe Ukoba, we need to transform things so that our country gets to work better for its citizens. Sure. So that is what trans um, African transformation is in a nutshell. I, I hear you, but what about the people who say, and there's a huge perception that you're fully aware of, that you were founded on the back of people being angry that the Zuma faction didn't win um, uh, um, the particular ANC conference at the time. Um, you're a man whom I've observed over the past five years that the, the party has been in existence. So good. No, man, this man has a lot of times said things that make sense said things and made decisions in parliament that are for the betterment of the country. How does this then, is the same person as a city, he's bitter, he's coming from a party of bitterness, people are just trying to rebel the ANC. Look, um, what people need to understand about our country is that politics is very volatile in our country. Okay. And they do not want, um, you can't be clean um, in politics. There must be something that is used to discredit you. Mm -hmm. Now, come ATM in 2018, led by a person who's never been in politics, mm -hmm. and therefore he does not have a corruption scandal anyway. Sure. Therefore, you need to taint his name, you know, and the best way to taint his name is to create a Roma. Mm -hmm. A Roma for over five years has never been proven. There's not <laughs> even single evidence that yes. a person can say, here's a picture of you, for example, with Mr. Mahashule or Mr. Zuma, yeah. or we see an email or we see in your bank account, there's nothing, there's something that came from these particular people. It's always, always, um, there's a perception that is there. And we want to remind people, and that's why we've been so patient, because it's not by people's doing that that perception is there. Rather, it is a system whereby if you're coming as a political party, not funded by the system that sustains itself through political parties, but you're coming, being funded by the church members, meaning you are going to be in the, an independent voice. You are not yes. going to just continue saying the things that are said by other people. Secondly, 
you are not um, you don't have scandals meaning I was with out there tafa there's someone who's going to you know open a file and say yeah. um, uh, so you kuluma ga kulu le na remember because we're na unche yeah bo yeah so there's always um, so that is how people operate in our country but we do want to stay to we've got no association with um, all of the people from the ANC our formation was largely because of the despondency particularly of the African churches yeah. who said the ANC only comes to them when they want elections. Okay. After the elections, they'll disappear. Um, the ANC had uh, a commission of inquiry to investigate which of their leaders were involved in the formation of other parties, including the ATM. Yeah. And that report that was done by the former speaker, um, Dr. Fring Jinwala, yeah. found that there's none, there's no one from the ANC that is involved um, in the formation and the running and the operation of the ATM. But for us, we'll always, um, you know, um, clarify this question time and time again. We are not going to be upset sure. because we know by, it's not by people's doing. It's some influence that is there with the particular purpose of trying to discredit us. Perhaps it's not a bad thing for this question to keep on coming up because it means you're making an impact. Yeah. Uh, uh, people don't chase after a car that's not moving. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Because you find that, you know, um, I see a lot of people on Twitter who keep roasting me. Okay. And, you know, some of my friends are like, how do you deal with this hate? I'm like, if we're not making an impact, they would not even say anything about us. The fact yeah. that we are in their mouths, mm. it means there's something we're doing right. So, if, in fact, for us, all of the hate is like motivation to say we're doing the right things, we're saying the right things, we must just keep on, um, you know, in the path that we've, we are, we've started because clearly it's making an impact. There's a perception that if you don't vote for one of the big parties, you are wasting your vote. Mm. Uh, and the big parties love driving that narrative. Yeah. Um, Uguti, if you are vo if you are voting for somebody who's smaller, then you are you are you are really wasting your vote. Um, um, how do you, how do you respond to that? You know, if people can look at the ATM mm -hmm. since 2019 up until now, mm -hmm. they can see Kuba that is the worst lie ever. Yeah. Because if you look at what ATM has been advocating for, or actually advocated in these four years in Parliament, you see that it is not about the quantity of seats. Yes, you need that quantity of seats in terms of taking decisions as a majority. Mm -hmm. But when you have substance as a party in parliament or mm -hmm. as a member, mm -hmm. then your substance will be understood or will be heard or will make impact. Um, look at, for example, the issue of um, immigration. Mm -hmm. Up until ATM got to parliament, that issue was not thoroughly discussed in parliament. It is ATM that pushed the issue to an extent that Dr. Aaron Mutsuelet and all of the other ministers... He has like taken from, decisions. He has taken decisions yeah. because um, of the influence of, of ATM. I remember that even the president um, instituted um, interministerial committee to look at, the, uh, look at the issue. And that is from an influence of just two members of parliament yeah. coming from the ATM. Look at the question of Pala Pala. Yeah, but other parties from your main opposition or official opposition, they were led by ATM in the process. It was ATM that was leading the charge for accountability to say, it can't be that there are a set of laws for you and another set of laws for uh, whoever is, uh, occupies um, political power. So when political parties speak like that, it means they're not speaking about what they offer. Rather, they're trying to dissuade people from... Um, voting for other so-called smaller parties. But the, the truth is, when the election comes, election season comes, there's no big part or small party. It's only after parties have been elected and you get to see this one has got 50, this one has got 10%, then you can see or you can say which one is a bigger part or small party. So for us as the ATM, the fact that um, the so-called big parties speak like that, it is because they feel the impact that is made by the so-called small parties. So, so you're basically saying quality over quantity sometimes goes a long Def way. Definitely. This past um, few years um, is an expression of that, that if you've got substance and at the same time you're solution-orientated and yeah. you're principled because you find that um, a lot of parties, um, they're not principled in the sense that it matters Zogoba who is in the wrong before they can speak out? If something, they're not principled to say, if something is wrong, it's wrong. Regardless whether it is President Ramaphosa or President Zuma or Advocate Mkwebane or Advocate Matonsela, um, if something is wrong, it's wrong. Okay? Yeah. Rather, Bona, they're like, okay, this is how we're going to approach it. This person is our person, he's beating for our interest, therefore we're going to keep quiet because we to wait. You understand? So for us, quality over quantity and most importantly, substance 
and then make sure that you articulate is in those funwanga band because mm -hmm. as members of parliament, that's what we are supposed to be doing. It is to express the wishes of the people. Yeah. You you spoke of the system earlier, Oguti. The reason some of these big parties are scared to delve into certain topics, it's because the system which consists of business people and funders yeah. say, okay, we can't speak about this or let's speak about this or we can't be too too loud about this. Mm. And you're saying that ATM obviously exists outside of the system because you're mm. saying it's all about traditional uh, churches, mm. um, African churches. Those are the people who are behind you and who are supporting you. That's, mm. where you, that's where you saw the gap. So how then do you have um, a person who at the time when you were, fo when you were founded like Mzonele Mangi who was big in the system, mm. then become such a, a notorious member of your organization? How did you allow that? Or what was your vision behind allowing him to mm. be part of the organization? Look, um, the party was formed in 2018. Mm -hmm. 2018, I think from July up until November, went across the country launching the party. Uh, January 2019, Mr. Mani joined the party. Okay. And when he joined the party, obviously the leadership said, there are certain skills that we can utilize From and him. make sure that yeah. the party does grow. Um, and that is what formed him being part of the leadership. However, to the minds of a lot of people, like we said, sometimes to a lot of people, politics is about personalities. It's really about the substance mm -hmm. and what people have to offer. That is why a lot, were like, a lot of people are saying, but Mr. Mani is a leader. You know, they were like, hey, who's this for you? Um, we've never seen him in any political party. Mm -hmm. He's a no one, he's a no vice, and all of those things. But for us, we knew that um, for us, it's not about personalities because the politics of personalities is the one that is dragging South Africa to the ground. I hear you. Because people are loyal to certain personalities instead of being loyal to their interest mm -hmm. and the future mm -hmm. of their own children. Yeah. That is why even us as a party, we're not, the party is not centered around me as an individual. Unlike other parties whereby you can see but this party is molded in the character of its leader, which yeah. is so-and-so. Yeah. So for us, um, we have a principle of if a person provides a skill that we can utilize that can better the country and grow the organization, we're going to utilize that skill. That's fair. So you were utilizing him because his skills were aligned with what you were trying to do. But then how do you how do you then go to him when he now becomes uh, the spokesperson for the Jacob Zuma Foundation? Once again, something that is marred by controversy. Don't you go to him and say, hey, no, to so and manj. how mm. did you feel about such decisions that he made even outside of the party? Look, um, the reality is that firstly, like we stated, we are funded by our church members and ordinary members. We mm -hmm. don't have big funders. Yeah. Even if you look at that IEC, um, you know, funding register, um, um, that funding report that yeah. they release every quarter, mm -hmm. you rarely find ATM there. So most of our members, for example, we've got our deputy chairperson. He works for a mine, mm -hmm. you know. Um, we've got other members. Our deputy secretary is also working in, consult um, in consultancy for some company as well. So we do not have the resources to take care of our leaders. Sure. Therefore, if a person comes to us and says, I've got this opportunity that will be able to assist me because I've got gaps, in my personal space um, financially. So we do not have the right to say we can't, you don't can't take do it. The, don't yeah. take it, especially yeah. if we're not going to fill that yeah. particular gap. Yeah. So for us, it's a matter of Ugoba. When a person wants, for example, it would have been unfair as well to say the deputy chairperson can work for a mine. The very same mining sector one transformed. Um, our one of our leaders can work in a consulting company. The very same consulting companies with you, Ogoba, they are milking the government because yes. um, you know the municipalities spend a lot of money in terms of e consultancy. But when Mr. Mzwani Limani wants a job somewhere else, we say no, don't take it. Mm -hmm. You know, so it would have been unfair on us and would have caused. Um, friction in terms of our leadership. So it is friction that we decided we do not want to go there. Do you, do you believe then that there is an advantage to not being heavily funded because you guys have the, the, the privilege of having professionals who are in different spheres being able to be on the ground in that professional setup and still have a political voice? Definitely. You know, one of the um, things I like about being independent is that when you debate there, there's no one who's going to call you after and say what you've just said does not represent our interests. Therefore, stop saying these things, you know. Um, I remember I was debating once. Um, there's a subject that we proposed in a debate. It was the issue of the informal economy. 
being used um, firstly that it must be um, it must be dominate, dominated by South Africans and it must be used to transform the economy. So we debated there. Almost all of the parties were actually against my um, the proposal that I had. Now, after the debate, one guy from the ruling party comes to me and, you know, he shakes me uh, my hand and says, oh, I spoke well. I ask him, but inside you were, uh, you were howling and heckling me. And when you were speaking, you were actually against me. And the guy said, hey, my brother, please understand, but this is politics. Yeah. We need to say what the po party bosses want. Mm. And the party bosses say whatever their funders want. Mm -hmm. So for me, I found that the reason why there'll never be truth and principle in our electoral system, it is because the issue of funding is not explored enough whether does the funding of political parties actually lead to um, um, public representative better representing the interests of the people or it makes them rather to better represent the interests of whoever that is funding them. So in our strong belief as an ATM, we believe, Ukoba, if you are funded by the very same banks, for example, look at um, people like Oba Butiton Bowen. Mm -hmm. He's a minister of finance. He speaks about a state bank mm -hmm. when he was, before he was appointed. Mm -hmm. But when he is a minister of finance, he says nothing, does nothing. It, yeah. Now, if you look at his um, that um, register of interest, you find that they own a lot of shares in banks. Now, there's no way you can bite the hand that feeds you. Yeah. There's no way you can advocate for a state bank. At the same time, you've got so much interest and you know how these um, um, companies operate. Mm -hmm. They will not, what they will do, they'll just give you shares. Now, when, uh, because you've got shareholding, you know that it is in your interest that... This, this company does well. Exactly. Yeah. So that is what, for example, in our view, is actually making political people to be amakog. Yeah. Because yeah. they have to speak about, when they speak to people, they say the right things. Because they know the issues of the people. But when they're in parliament, they need to take decisions. They take decisions in accordance to the interests of their funders. What I'm getting from you is that through shareholding and, and such interests, maybe people being on the board of directors of big international or multinational companies, these multinationals have captured the government like, just yeah. unofficially. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's capture. Um, I want to make an example. There's the issue of labor brokers. Um, you know, the unions were actually fighting against labor brokers. You know, in my previous work, there's a lady who was a cleaner. She used to come two times a week. One day she comes to my office and she's crying. She's asking for, um, for a bus fare and I give it to her. And then she's like, I know you are going to think I am drinking my money, but here's my pay slip. She was getting paid 170 rands per fortnight. Now, I could not understand because... How can a person who's doing so much work be mm -hmm. actually be paid so, uh, so little? Only to find that majority of the money goes to the labor broker. Yeah. The labor broker take their profits and whatever they want, they give peanuts to the worker. Mm. Now, some of the union leaders from COSATU and them, they're actually owning labor brokering companies, you know. <laughs> They've got shareholding there. So that is what is wrong in our system. Look, for yeah. example, oh, Tito Mboweni, he's a minister of finance. During his tenure as a minister of finance, he... He old mutual disinvest from South Africa, meaning it, it moves away from the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. It is now registered, I think, in the London Stock Exchange. And that happens during his time. Hardly six months after he stopped being a member of, uh, he stops being a minister of finance, he's appointed to be the chairperson of the board of the very same old mutual yeah. that disinvested during his time. Yeah. So you can see Ukuba politics, unfortunately, to a lot of people is a space whereby Abantu can just enrich themselves. Others through corruption, others through systematically um, being appointed in terms of um, being board members or Abanye, they will just have shareholding, but ultimately it's about their interest. It's rare to find a person who is, when you look at their interest, maybe what you need to do sometimes is uh, maybe have a talk whereby you just go into the member's interest to mm. see um, this member of parliament has got so many shares up and up and up, has got so many properties. How can a person who is earning so much have so much um, assets, cars and houses? And how can, and, and you, you are able to see that these people that have so much assets and have so much um, uh, shares in these companies, Check how vocal they are in terms of the issues. And look at these members of parliament who are just having Ipaiseki and maybe they do not declare is in residency. Check how 
um, you know, vocal they are. You get to see, Koba, the ones who are not captured by the system, as you say, are more vocal. But I, I hear you speak about um, financial interests being the biggest issue that's pulling the country backwards instead of pushing it forward. Then what is, what is the ideal funding model for political parties, in your, in your opinion? You know, if political parties were to be funded by their members, um, then it would, you know, um, assist us in terms of, you know, that this member has got an interest because he's a community member. Mm -hmm. He wants this part, his party to grow. Immediately, you've got big corporates that are giving you 20 million. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Thomas Sankara said, whoever funds you controls you. Yeah. Now, if you were to look at, for example, how the likes of your DA, all of these white aligned political parties, check whoever that is funding them and check when they speak, whose interests are they really representing. So, but if they are going to go campaign, um, you know, in the township, in the villages, people don't understand the link between funding and a party representing certain interests. So for us, what is ideal is parties must be funded by their members and then can work with the parliament funding and the IEC funding used to supplement whoever or whatever that the party is able to raise legitimately from its members. And want to actually applaud this system whereby the, the funders are actually declared, disclosed, whereby, disclosed yeah. so yeah. that people can get to see, Kuba, as I'm voting for this party, I'm also voting for the interests of the people that is bankrolling this particular party. I hear you. So... If you know that, for example, if you're voting for Party X, it's funded by a Coca-Cola. Yeah. And how do you feel about how Coca-Cola runs their business? It means you're giving them a vote. Exactly. Yeah. Because Coca-Cola will have a significant influence yeah. in terms of what that party does. Because most of the time as a voter, you, um, you, your, your voice is only when you are making your marks during um, the elections. Whereas a funder... Um, look, for example, how often do political parties, um, leaders, actually engage the communities? You find that once in a while they are going to engage communities. And behind the doors, you find that every month there is no month that passes between them as a party and whoever that is funding them. Therefore, this one that has got the money is influencing, you know, um, your your conduct is influencing whatever that you say is a political leader. So for us, it's something that we need to explore. And the other issue that has not been thoroughly ex explored is a lot of um, other parties, their funders are not declared because it is via cash. And that is why you find, um, you know, other people... When it comes to the issue of, for example, for example, drugs, they are not going to be as vocal about dealing with the issue of drugs that is killing our people. Because by us, the majority of the people that are funding them are actually drug lords yeah. or people that Who are... Who want pro protection. Who want protection, yeah. you know. Because, you know, if you watch these movies and you see how um, drug lords, business people, all of these sectors are actually Aligned, using yeah. uh, using politicians for their interests. Sure. We can't be naive to think it does not happen in our country. The fact that we don't have investigative journalists that will actually expose Okoba, these particular drug lords are influencing this particular party. That is why this party will defend drug lords, you know. So it's something that we need to have a look at. Maybe in the nearest, nearest future we find a way to actually expose such parties who profit from the suffering of our people. <clears throat> and th that's very interesting that you speak of the the, the private sector um, people who do bad like drug lords being interlinked with politicians and using them for their front. Um, the, 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 there's uh, Al Jazeera released a documentary recently, the Gold Mafia. It was a four part mm. series, and a lot of our South African politicians appeared mm. on mm. the documentary. Do you think our system has the capacity to prosecute such people? Because those investigative journalists, all it takes is for a case number to be opened and go to Al Jazeera and say, "Please, can you hand over mm. the evidence?" Because clearly, you've done the work to mm. provide the evidence. Mm. You know? Yeah, it goes. Back to political will, mm -hmm. you know, the root of our problems in our country, they stem from lack of political will. Um, because if you are going to have a political party or political leaders that are implicated in the smuggling of gold, therefore what they are going to do is that they are going to protect each other from prosecution. Yeah. Because, you know, Kuzobanjo, this person today... The next person is, um, is, you know, is another person within your circle. And before you know it, it's going to be yourself. Therefore, that is why many 
um, you know, um, most most of these cases they don't go anywhere. I'm sure you watch um, this um, show Usu's Octol. Yes. You find that well, X there is actually being threatened, and you find that also the cases relating to, um, you know, drug dealing they don't go far. Yeah. Only because there's syndicates, and these mm -hmm. syndicates have got the protection mm -hmm. of political leaders. Mm -hmm. Similarly, with the issue of illegal mining. Whilst we need to root out illegal miners because they're terrorizing our communities, mm -hmm. but there's no way to sustainably do so if you don't deal with the syndicates. Sure. Because there's no way a young boy coming from, a young boy as, as young as 14 coming from Mozambique will go underground, illegally mine, take that gold and sell it to someone. You know, there's a system and that system includes mining um, houses. It means it, it includes um, government officials, includes people in the law enforcement space. It also includes um, politicians. Therefore, the biggest problem that we face is that politicians are at the core of the destruction of our country. That is why you'll never see political will. For example, look um, at the shutdown that was recent in March. Yeah. We saw so many police that were in the streets. The police visibility was yeah, high. Yeah. But we know there's high, um, you know, hot spots for drug, for, for drug dealing, for hijacked bil buildings. Yeah. But why have we not seen... The uh, same police. Th the same police, the same effort when it was there during the shutdown being used to actually deal with the illegal miners, the drug dealers, and all of those people that are doing harm to our citizens. It is because it is not in the interest of the politician that has been captured and the politician that benefits from all of these crimes. Do, do you think that this thing of politicians um, being captured goes as deep as industries we will ne we never even thought that politicians are involved? I'll make an example. Uh, it's almost 10 years and the country still doesn't know who murdered Senzo Meiwa. Uh, mm. it, that's somebody who's in sports. Mm. Um, there's uh, uh, musicians involved who are now where people have said a lot of things about them. Do you think there's definitely political interference even in such cases? Definitely. Because um, look at how highly politicized this Senzo Miwa case. Um, they remove one of the advocates today for their... Um, even this judge, mm -hmm. Maumela, apparently now is going to be removed. So man, there's so much that is happening there. And it would give an impression in Ukoba. This case has to take a particular direction. You'll recall that even the people that were allegedly the criminals, mm -hmm. one of them said, mm, not the crime that I was said I'm arrested for, it is a certain crime. It has got nothing to do with the killing of Senzo Meiwa. Yeah. So which clearly shows Ukoba, it, because, you know, a criminal network has got no limits. So we can't be saying, you know, we can't be, be, we can't be thinking, Ukoba, the criminal networks that we have in our poli in our politics, um, they go towards, for example, the issue of illegal mining or um, gold smuggling, etc. It will include the, such issues. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the issue of the killing of O A K A. Mm -hmm. You find that um, you know we are going to struggle to get, um, you know, um, any answers. Any answers. Yeah. Whereas there are cameras there, yeah. you know, <laughs> and you should be having At all angles. <laughs> yes, and you should be having an intelligence. Yeah. yeah. That is going to give confidence. So, well, actually, we've got a functioning police system in our country whereby a person that commits a crime will be arrested. But I want to take you back to say the root causes of our problems, it is political will. Political will um, that is influenced by people that have been captured, people that no longer serve or act in the best interest of the people, rather they act in their own best interest and the interest of whoever that is sustaining their lives and their livelihoods. Likewise, with the Tabo Besta case, we, we actually, know, at this point, exactly. we don't know what's going on. Imagine, you know, because if you check how systematic yeah. those crimes were, yeah. um, you know, I remember when that thing blew up, a lot of people were actually saying he's going to be killed. Yeah. Oh, they are going to try to find a way. Katie Kuba, McKenzie said yeah, that too. He must yeah. not be allowed to testify. Yeah. Because if he's allowed to testify and he's able to speak there and tell the truth to say, this is how I actually got out, it's going to implicate a lot of powerful people. Mm -hmm. You know, we know in our country, but Oba, you are powerful. You are almost immune to prosecution. Invincible. Yeah, yeah look at, immune. for example, the issue of um, Palapal. Yeah. You've got robbers that come to the president's private farm. They steal money from him. And look how, and the president has actually confirmed, but yeah, I had money there and it was stolen. But the question would be, 
has those people, those criminals ever been arrested? Mm -hmm. And even now, there's no one that is following up to say if there's indeed justice because immediately those guys get to be arrested. One of the questions ask, that are going to emanate, how much did you steal? Yes. And the president will find it very difficult to explain, Ukoba. These guys say they stole a certain amount of money, whereas on his papers he said he only had so much money. Mm -hmm. So all of this is, is, is rooted in the criminal system or the mafia state that South Africa has become. Whilst it might not be as open for people to see, but South Africa is a mafia state mm -hmm. if you look at the amount of criminality. Look at, for example, the ESCOM cartels that are yeah. there. Um, look at the Tabo Pesta case. So there's criminality all around, but at the core of the criminality is politicians from the ruling party, not all of us. We are citizens. We, we look at all these things from outside and we have opinions. Uh, something like ESCOM, um, I, I want to delve into that. You, from, you as in, on the inside, you're in government, as a member of parliament, you're in government. From the inside, um, what went wrong at ESCOM? I know it's a very detailed topic, but if you can just, uh, in your op own opinion, what went wrong or what is still going wrong? Because all of a sudden, it seems like there's starting to be a miracle where they're fixing things, mm. <laughs> you know? Mm. So wh why couldn't they fix it earlier? It goes back to the interest. Because if you check, for example, now they're using diesel. Mm -hmm. Um, and this diesel, basically, it is diesel that there's no use for, there's no need for diesel mm -hmm. if you've got coal. Mm -hmm. And coal that we have in abundance in our country for more than 400 years. The first issue is that the coal prices that are there, UNESA recommends um, like 350 per ton of coal. That, as, um, that, is, the um, that is the price of, um, of buying coal in our country. However, you've got ESCOM that has got evergreen contracts with certain companies to buy something that NASA is recommending, but it must be sold at 350 but now they are buying at more than 1.2. Yeah. So prices have been inflated. Yeah. So it is a very, very volatile space because all people want to eat there. So you've got a contract of 10, 20 years, 30 years. Therefore, people are going to fight for ESCOM. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that private sector or how you get basically get to privatize things is to create an illusion but they are not working and people are going to say um, let's privatize this thing because if it is in the hands of the private sector you know it's going to work out whereas it's the reason why it's not working it is not because it's not working it is because people want to deliberately make it fail we went to escom beginning of the year as a portfolio committee yeah when we got there um, some of the unions were telling us, Sukoba, there are power stations whereby there is about eight units in a power station, but only two are working. ESCOM is not investing enough in terms of the maintenance of these um, units so mm -hmm. that if a power station has got eight units, um, all eight units must work. Mm -hmm. Because if you are to look at all of these power stations, you find that very few are, um, are operating at an optimal level. Yeah. You'll find a power station has got six units, only two are working. And the reason why only two are working is because the others have not been maintained. Yeah. And if you're to look at the financials of ESCOM, you'll see Okoba, the maintenance of power stations for the past two and three years has actually gone down. And there's no, it's like driving a car, on I maintain you. Yeah. It's going to, like, it's not going to operate optimally because you're not maintaining the car, you're not taking it for service. Therefore, the solution lies in the maintenance of e power stations. Mm -hmm. Once power stations have been maintained and they work optimally, um, then we're going to see about um, load shedding will be a thing of the past. Yeah. And to show about this thing, it is political in nature. In one unit, um, one power station, Henrina, I think it's in, it's, it's in Pumalanga, there was a general manager there. When he got there, only two of the six units were actually working. He turned the power station around from two units up until six, mm -hmm. meaning the power station was working fully functional. Fully functional. Yeah. Did they not take him out of that power station and send him to group HR? Meaning by frustrated yeah. because this person is an engineer, he just wants to turn around. Instead of taking him to another poor performing power station and turn it around, yeah. they took, took him to group HR, whereby he's not going to be at all um, impactful in terms of the I way. Hear you. I yeah, hear well, you. Yeah. So there's a lot of um, other general managers who are frustrated because they want to create an impression, Okoba, um, our SOEs are not functional. 
And once they do that, then the private sector comes in. The private sector, when it comes in, it exists for profit. Can you imagine in South Africa, whereby you've got 60 million people that need power? Now, if you've got a, a company that has access um, to this, um, you know, this client base of 60 million, you are basically going to kill it, you know. Look at, for example, how the private sector has been milking um, the issue of the dying of the SAA. Mm -hmm. Because when SAA died, other private companies of Lysafe actually are milking right. that space. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas in other countries, look at what is making e Ethiopian Airlines um, to be so progressive, yeah. whereas it is making SAA um, to be so regressive. So the root cause of the problem is that the people that are in government goes back to what we spoke about earlier. Because they've got interest in these corporates and these companies, they are being used in order to frustrate these companies so that these companies, are no, uh, these SOEs, are no longer functional. And then these people, um, they come in in the private sector, they buy, after they buy, then they get to benefit for life. Because think about it, if you're a minister, you minister only for five years mm -hmm. at maximum. Um, unless uh, there's another person that is going to come and appoint you again as a minister. But if a person says, look, minister, yes, you are a minister of um, the SOEs, you know, um, do your thing. We want to come in into that space. You know, in the, um, in the past two years, this language of private uh, public partnership. partnership. P -P Triple P. <laughs> this, yes. The pri private sector. And this private sector, if you've got shares, if you, you have shares for life. Mm -hmm. So when, you know, because we're led by greedy people, Umtu would rather collapse this, this asset of the government, mm -hmm. this asset of the people, in order for him... And his to, family. And his, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, to, in order for him to have access to this um, company whereby he's going to have shares only for himself. Yeah. So that is what Abandaba Kriti are actually doing to our country. Um, you, you speak about the private sector and the political, once again, being the core reason that ESCOM has failed. People like the, th that man who was moved from being a GM mm. after turning around a power station by Umfagagu Group HR. Um, after a dramatic, dramatic exit that uh, consisted of a very well shot interview, mm. uh, after uh, 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 moving abroad, you guys then called um, Andre De Reiter to come and answer to mm. the portfolio committee. Mm. But instead of answering to the portfolio committee, capitalism, once again, he mm. releases everything in a book, rather. Yeah. So uh, do you think it's still in that same line of Oguti? Even him, he was never interested in, in, in mm. fixing ESCOM. Yeah. Look, even his appointment, um, because he used to be CEO of NAMPAC. Yeah. And if you were to check the share price of NAMPAC from the time he was appointed and at the time he left NAMPAC, he actually ran the company to the ground. Mm -hmm. So all of these appointments that are done in terms of the people that lead the SOEs, they are done deliberately so that you've got people that will fail dismal in terms of turning things around. And then when they fail, the private sector comes in. Same thing happened with SAA. Same thing happens in post office. Same thing happens in all of the SOEs, you know. So the, the, the attitude of the current government or this administration, it is to take whatever that is, a, um, uh, is an asset of the state is rather taken to um, the private sector. Look, um, there's, there's no, we can't be hiding. But Omise Ramaphosa is a businessman. Yeah. For him, his bottom line is profit. <laughs> you can't take him and make him a president of a country whereby his bottom line must be service, um, delivery. service delivery and yeah. improving the quality of the yes. people. Yeah. Because yeah. when you do that, um, it requires that you need to take away some of the powers or some of the benefits from the private sector so that the state is empowered. Look at how many um, commissions, um, envoys, and all of these um, you know, interventions that he, you know, he's taken power away from the public sector to the private sector. Whereas we should be boosting state capacity. Yeah, well, it should be the state that is leading um, the transformation of the economy, not saying the private sector must come in because the interests of the private sector and the interests of the state, they are, they are opposed. Private sector is concerned about profit. The public sector or the state ought to be concerned about the quality of lives of the people. So these things, as well as do Ambelan, but we find a president that is more um, concerned about taking things from the, public, uh, from the public sector and give that responsibility to the, to the private sector. 
one of our one of our biggest issues as the youth um i'm i'm 28 years old so i fall slap bang in the middle of being in the youth is that many of us just don't have jobs mm. um if we it, if it, we, it's either we don't have jobs or people are underemployed and when i say underemployed i mean people can have a masters in psychology but they are working in a call center mm. answering phone phone calls not that there's anything wrong with that but you're underemployed if you took money and resources and time to further your education <coughs> to that level then you're going to do, do a job that does not require that much education mm. um what is the solution firstly from you in your opinion and also as the atm towards mm. job creation yeah i think we need to start by transforming uh the system and the quality of education um the reason why i think it starts there because you find that whatever that the education system um, whatever its output has to go to the job market. So it's not really about, you don't start by saying you need to transform the economy without dealing with what are the capabilities of, um, what capabilities do young people get via the education system. So what we're proposing is the ATM number one, there needs to be a heavy investment in terms of the infrastructure yeah. of education. Mm -hmm. If you go to a public school and go to a private school, in a private school, Utusange and Eskolwin, the environment is an environment of learning. Mm -hmm. It's an environment that would entice any young person to say, I'm in a space where I need to learn. Yeah. Whereas when you go to a public school, you find that the environment there, you know, it does not really psychologically entice you to learn. Mm -hmm. And that is why it is very difficult for some of the students to actually come out of public schools. The second thing is that our education system must be centered around giving young people tradable skills okay. so that when a young person is leaving metric, they've got a skill they can use. If Umtu um, is applying for a job, they can't get a job, we'll say, all right, fine, I can't get this particular job. However, I've got this particular skill I can utilize so that I can make a living for myself. Not a case whereby in Doye to it is driven towards being job seekers. And even job seekers that are not um, really getting any jobs because when the quality of education actually goes down, it means you almost become unemployable. So we're saying that our education system must be driven towards getting young people to have skill. Um, what do you change for it to be skills based or tradable skills uh, 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 focused? What do you change in the education system? What you need to change is Kakolo there. It is what is being taught. Okay. We cannot be taught and, and what is being taught must be aligned to the needs of the economy. Okay. In the sense that if you look at the economy now, look at which areas require um, or have got um, um, require um, um, workers, they require businesses, they require input from the job market. Then you prepare people for these. For example, currently, you've got the digital economy. Yeah. Um, that is why you've got about Airbnb, all of these apps as a coin. Now, we as the ATM are saying, Goba, coding should be part of um, our, 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 our education system. The issue of math and science should be critical and core, not um, where the past, um, past mm -hmm. mark, rather invest more in terms of even if you take um, teachers to teachers colleges, upskill them so that they are, they are better placed to actually impart the certain skills and the knowledge to young people. And once you've got a band that have got these skills, they are going to be able to utilize these skills for the job market. For me, I want to blame the government because if you're going to have 5 million, for example, unemployed graduates, and you find that almost 60% of these unemployed graduates are coming from um, you know, a certain faculty, mm -hmm. you need to come in and say, but these qualifications are not leading to job um, opportunities. So let's pause it for the next five years, yes. this, this qualification. Yeah, let's pause it. You must yeah, be that radical. Yeah. Yes. Why, sh why would you allow young people to spend four years in university or technicon yeah, yeah. for something that you know but Abba Zofumana Misebenzi sure, because there's more than a million of other young people with the very same qualifications who can't get jobs. So that is what we're saying when it comes to the issue of the education system. The second issue when it comes to job creation is that number one, you need, the government needs to transform the economy 
by driving the, um, the, the, the spending of government to shift towards small businesses instead of the government spending being um, tilted towards big businesses. Mm -hmm. Currently, the government has got a budget of over $2 trillion, um, um, which is all of the departments, agencies, Chapter 9 institutions, etc. However, less than 20% of that budget actually goes to SMMEs. Mm -hmm. The rest goes to big companies. For example, um, you are going to go to an airport, everything is bit vest. Yeah. Everything, it beat vest, it beat vest has actually captured... Evergreen um, airports. <laughs> yeah, Zonk is in, it is always beat vest. Yeah. Now, the, you know, um, I want to make an example. You know, in 2020, you found that um, some companies were actually disinvesting from South Africa. Mm -hmm. The ones about Adidas and, uh, and others were actually move, slowly but slowly moving away. But the likes of Obatu were actually opening a lot of shops yeah. across the different malls. Yeah. Because... When you are spending from, number one, a local company as a government, you are actually making money to circulate in the economy. I hear you. Secondly, a small company, in SMME, once they get a business, they'll want to grow most. You know, because if, for example, you, um, let's say you have, you, 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 you have a fully-fledged media house, mm -hmm. you get an opportunity, what are you going to do? You are going to employ more people. Sure. You are going to um, um, open offices in Gauteng, in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. However, if you are going to go to a big media company, what are they going to do? They take this money and they want to invest in another economy, mm -hmm. in another country, because mm -hmm. in South Africa, they've already reached the ceiling. Yeah. So that is a second issue. Now, or the first solution when it comes to job creation, Ukoba, when you buy from SMMEs, that on its own transforms the economy. Mm -hmm. The second issue is that we need more locally produced products. Because if you buy a product that is um, made in China, um, it, it means you're actually creating jobs in, in China. China. Because the people that made this product are in China. Mm -hmm. If you go through um, uh, across our country, you know, the infrastructure when it comes to factories is there. Because we used to have factories all over mm -hmm. the country, partic particularly in the Bantu stands. Go mm -hmm. to Transkai, there were factories there. Go to Siskai, there were factories there. Go to Kwadka, go to a lot of these um, areas in our country. But they're just um, buildings that are there that are not used. That have been abandoned. Uh, yeah. Yes. So that is why we're saying as the ATM Okoba, the government needs to give incentives for companies to actually produce to produce um, goods here in South Africa. Sure. Because once you do that, it means you are going to have more people that are employed to produce the products here. And obviously, the money will be able to circulate here. Now, if you are able to do these two things at a core, then you are able to grow the economy. Mm -hmm. And government must not be apologetic when it comes to affirming um, SMMEs and cooperatives in the economy. For example, if you go to Churo, if you've got a child there, they will tell you this is where you need to buy your uniform. Yeah. You can't... They've created an ecosystem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But how is a government not saying, Okoba, in this particular place, let's, for example, El Siki mm -hmm. there are 50 schools there. And you know, Okoba, they are going to need shirts. Yeah, go, they are going to need socks. They are going to need trousers. They are going to need jerseys. You've got cooperatives of a band from the area. These people, I don't think Bangakakwa, Ukwenza yeah. Ishet, yeah. you as a government to say these, um, um, these schools here, they must pro uni procure uniform from these cooperatives. That way the economy of El Siki Siki yeah. will circulate there, meaning the ecosystem that the private sector has, 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 has created for their own benefit, and that is working. The government can, can actually do the same thing mm. for the people and their economies. And this is not limited to the issue of the of um of the, the, the school uniform sector, but all other sectors whereby the, the the government can actually come in and most importantly create um mass economic participation. Because if you've got cooperatives El Siki Siki supplying a uniform for the skills for the schools El Siki Siki, it means when you go to Tequini, you are going to have different people there. When you go to Ezanin, you are going to have different people. Unlike a case where by now we've got one company, which is a student prince, that is dominating nationally. Yeah. Yeah, but so there's no way because you know what you need to drive, Tina, is that let us have people that are going to participate in the economy um, in a massive way, 
Britain instead of having one company that is going to monopolize the space. Sure. Because our country, our economy is unfortunately defined by monopolies. Go to the banking sector, there's going to be five or six companies there. Um, that are dominating. Go to the telecommunications. It's either MTN, Telcom, Celsi, Vodacom, yeah. um, five or six that are dominating. However, if you want to diversify the economy, you need to have different players. And once there are many smaller players, exactly yeah. many smaller players. Once yeah. there are many smaller players, what's going to happen is that people are going to get employed, and the economy will not circulate amongst very few hands. It's going to circulate amongst different people and that is how you actually grow the economy and create jobs in the process not a case whereby the economy does grow but the growth of the economy does not translate to job creation sure. because it is the very same few players that are dominating the economy but our system our thought as the atm is to break down these oligopolies and have an economy that has so many diverse yeah. um, players in the economy um, as, 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 as one of our closing remarks, you, Mr. Vuyazungula, you said that a lot of people have perceived you as an inexperienced politician. So as a person who's not known as a seasoned politician, um, why uh, must our viewers here vote for the ATM? Precisely because the seasoned politicians, they are seasoned or they experience in terms of taking the country um, to the drain. That yeah. is what, because I would understand if a person is saying, I'm a seasoned politician, mm. I manage to reduce unemployment, I manage to reduce poverty, I manage to reduce crime. But you find that people want to remain seasoned politicians by the amount of years they spend in public office. But people do not look at, okay, you've got these 20 years being in public office, but what has that done for the people? Whereas us as the ATM, what we are offering, it is practical solutions. That is why, as I'm speaking to you, you're actually engaging me because you can see, yeah, man, this is practical. Mm -hmm. Because what we, what we need to move towards to as a citizens now to say, let us have practical solutions. I want this thing of slogans, rhetoric, you know, something that it does not make sense. It's not cutting it. Yeah. We need to say, when it comes to job creation, buy local and buy black, for example, Aban can say yes, because look at the Jews in our country. When they are buying, they always make sure that Imali circulates amongst them. That is why you'll never see a poor Jew. You'll never see a Jew begging for a job because they are very, very conscious. So the point I'm making is that when one listens to us as an ATM, they can see Kuba were practical. They can see Kuba was solution orientated. And they can see Okuba all of these things that we're actually proposing. You know, it's not record science. To say, Okoba, when you produce is in Upper South Africa, you are actually creating jobs up in South Africa. We can't be importing it with big. We can't be importing towels. We can't be importing soap. We have the capabilities sure. here. What is just lacking is the political will. So we as the ATM have the political will because we are not in bed with the very same people that actually profit from this thing that is happening. And at the same time, we are not funded by the very same people who are benefiting from the system. Yeah, no. um, um, you know, I got to parliament in 2019. Mm -hmm. I still live in the same flat I was living in in 2018. Yeah, but I've not changed my life because there's someone that is bankrolling me, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, my life has remained largely the same, you know. So I want to say to the people, they must vote for ATM because we need servant leaders. Um, and... You know, I use my social media a lot in terms of listening to the views. You sure. know, what I'm sharing to you now is not my wisdom. Yeah. It is not because I'm an intellect. Mm -hmm. It's because I engage people. Yeah. There are people who come to me and say, you are a public representative. Therefore, please raise this thing or please look into this idea. Mm -hmm. And then I look, I investigate and I try to research so that when I speak to another person, I speak from a position of being informed. But who is the originator of this idea? It is a citizen. So that is how we view ourselves as an ATM, Mokoba, who are the mouthpiece, who are the representative of the people. All of these things that we articulate, they actually come from the citizens, not from us, because as you no, no, kunaband. <laughs> Mr. Vuya Zungula, President and Leader of the African Transformation Movement. He sits in a number of portfolio committees as well in Parliament. All I'm going to say is register to vote. Your vote is your choice. The